and welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, a podcast where we discuss all things relating to your well-being, including interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food facts series. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host and nutritionist with a passion for well-being. I will take a moment to let you know that you can subscribe to my podcast on all good podcast providers like Apple Podcasts and on YouTube and Spotify. I'll put all that information in the show notes. Before I introduce today's guest, I will also mention that although I will often be speaking with experts, any information or advice provided in Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast is not intended to be used to treat, cure or prevent injuries or medical conditions and is not a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today I am here with Alan McCubbin. Alan is an accredited sports dietitian who works with athletes of all levels, including well-known cycling teams, Olympians, windsurfers and more. Alan and I chat about his practice, Next Level Nutrition, and about his recent PhD in nutrition at Monash University that focused on sodium intake and sodium status during exercise of endurance athletes. And that topic will be the main focus of our discussion today. Alan, you are an accredited sports dietitian. So what drew you towards studying dietetics with a focus on sport? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, well, I guess, like like a lot of people that end up doing sports nutrition, it was some experience in sport myself. Um, in my teenage years, I was a, an athlete uh, in sailing, actually, of all things, which oh, is a right. bit, bit niche, but yeah. um, you know, sort of finished that up in university because it's just such a ridiculously expensive sport when you sort of get to the, the higher level and it was just yeah. not worth pursuing, unfortunately. But, um, you know, through that program and going through, you know, state-based youth development programs and all that sort of thing, got exposure at least a little bit to sort of sports mm-hmm. science and sports medicine uh, and thought through that process I'd always wanted to do physiotherapy actually and um, didn't get into physio. Um, and then it was uh, Sports Medicine Australia had a careers day. I think they still do them. But um, back when I was in year 12 and saw the dietitian there who was working at uh, one of the AFL clubs and thought, oh, oh cool. that would be interesting. Hadn't really thought of that as a possible career pathway before but thought oh, that sounds really interesting enjoyed studying you know, nutrition in year 12 the bits and pieces you get exposed to so mm-hmm. put that as my second preference didn't get physio ended up as a dietitian instead yeah. and you haven't looked back from from the look of things well no my wife's a physio and oh, um perfect. now I know what they actually do I'm very glad I never did physio <laughs> to be honest <laughs> I have a, a mother and a sister who are physios so I know all about mm. it as well yes not once did I get a massage mind you <laughs> mm. well they all tend to break down after about 15 years of practice unfortunately yeah it's pretty hard work I think yeah. physically and mentally yep. Te- about 10 years after you um, graduated and you spent some time in clinical practice you went uh, back to Monash or went to Monash and did a PhD and the title is Dietary Sodium Intake Practices of Endurance Athletes and Implications for Sodium Status During Exercise. Done oh, your homework. Today I'd like to talk mainly about hydration and sodium status during exercise. Yep. Uh, but before we get on to that, I would like to hear a little bit about you and what keeps you busy and engaged these days. I believe, I know that you lecture and you're a researcher at Monash, but you also have a practice called Next Level Nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I believe you were the first people in Australia to start using an online only sports nutrition consultancy about 10 years ago now. Yeah, it'll be the 10th anniversary later this year, I think, um, October from memory. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, as far as I know, I was the first dietitian to have an online only business in Australia. Um, some others were doing a bits and pieces, I think, of online consults, but no one was doing that exclusively as a business yeah. at the time. Yeah, I mean, that you were an early adopter, obviously. So what made you um, decide to do it that way? Um, I was doing some bricks and mortar, you know, private practice clinic mm-hmm. type work at the time, um, uh, often after hours because I was still working in hospitals. I sort of moved in more into the management side of things in yeah. the hospital system at the time and then doing private practice after hours and it was pretty long days driving all around town, you know, to Mm -hmm. the hospital, to the private practice to back. And, um, uh, you know, the the margins in bricks and mortar private practice isn't fantastic. 
Um, and so I was having a grumble to my wife about it one night and she said, oh, why don't you just do it via the internet? And so I thought, hmm, why don't I just do it via the internet? Yeah. And um, so, you know, about a year, you know, sort of spent about a year sort of researching it, thinking about it, trying to design in my head how it was all going to work mm. and then, uh, yeah, launched it at the end of, of 2010. That's brilliant. But one of the obvious benefits is that um, – you get a lot more reach because you don't have to be sitting face to face with with a client. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did. Um, there was a symposium around um, telehealth and and online bits and pieces in dietetics at one of the Dietitians Association conferences, mm-hmm. probably in twenty thirteen, I would guess. Um, and they asked me to come along and speak about my experience there. And and I actually got out a map and sort of put little pins on the map all the places that I had consulted clients from and I think within the first 12 months I'd seen people in every state and territory of Australia which was wow. uh yeah pretty unheard of at the time uh, yes. but very very normal now yes I mean uh 10 years ago people were not likely to travel interstate probably to see a professional um no. so you were you were definitely ahead of your time and probably set yourself up well for this whole coronavirus pandemic you were yes. already yeah you know, well I mean it was yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, you know, uh, all of this happened. Everyone's, oh, we're going to move online and move online. I'm like, okay, I'll just look at my list and see who's coming up. Yeah. Um, but no, you, you're totally right. I mean, I had people in, um, like people who were fly in, fly out workers in Karatha, you know, in outback oh, yeah. Western Australia and, you know, um, sort of well, not remote, remote, but certainly not major cities in, you know, northwestern Tasmania and places like that that would never be able to access, you know, a specialist sports dietitian yeah. without driving hours or possibly, you know, getting on a plane and going somewhere. Um, and so that was a real, you know, benefit for them in, in the early days because that just didn't exist back then. Alan, are all your clients athletes or most of them? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. my private practice is a very small part of my overall work yeah um and it always has been it, i never intended it to be you know the majority of my my work or my income or anything like that it was always a supplement something i enjoyed uh, but not something that i ever intended to be the main part of my career so uh, from that ex- that perspective i could sort of set up the business um from a you know, look for your marketing point of view to be specific to athletes yeah. um and tailor it that way you know, occasionally you get people coming along that are, you know, they might just go to the gym once a week or something like that um, but most of them would probably be, you know, a little bit more serious in terms of their exercise. Um, I mean, when I say serious, they'll still be, you know, someone running their first half marathon or something like yeah. that. Um, but, you know, but doing doing a bit more. Yeah, yeah fairly yeah. dedicated. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So in episode 44, I interviewed Steph Gaskell, who's a Monash University colleague of yours. Yep. And we talked about fueling during exercise. So I think that episode will go very well or go hand in hand with this one where we're going to be talking about hydration and sodium status. So let's start with the basics, Alan. What is sodium and where do we obtain it in our diets? Yeah, yeah. sodium essentially is a mineral. Um, so we think about, you know, calcium and potassium and all, you know, we talk about the vitamins and the minerals. Well, it's a mineral. Um, where we get it from, well, the most abundant, um, source of sodium in our diet is salt, which is basically sodium chloride. So sodium yeah. and chloride, you know, uh, bound together. Um, and that's where we get the vast majority of sodium in our diet. Um, and sodium is one of those minerals, you know, you know, with some nutrients, it's like, well, are we getting enough? Do we need to supplement? Sodium is usually the exact opposite. It's yes. like, am I getting too much? Is that a problem from a, a health perspective? Um, so quite a different sort of scenario as we think about it from a general health and nutrition angle. Yeah, that's right. A lot of peak health bodies in Australia advise you to reduce sodium, don't they? But I yes. think the story is a little bit different when it comes to athletes. Um, and can you tell us also what is the function of sodium in the body? Why do we need that mineral? Yeah, I mean, it has several functions um, in terms of, you know, different nerves in our body communicating with each other and, and things like that. But certainly the main function, I guess the one we tend to think of in the context of sport and exercise is around how it controls the shift of fluid within our body uh, and also the, the total amount of fluid in our body. So the majority of sodium in our body, um, actually, so I'll go back a step. If we think about all the, the water in our body, Um, which is usually between about 50 and 65% of our body weight is water. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that sits in what we can sort of classify as sort of three different compartments in the body where that water can exist. Mm -hmm. So the first one is inside our cells, which we call intracellular fluid. And then we have the water that's not in our cells, extracellular fluid, and we can break that into sort of two parts, the, uh, the intravascular fluid or the plasma volume, so basically the fluid that's in our blood vessels, yeah. our arteries and, and veins and capillaries and so on, and then the fluid that sits not in our blood vessels but not inside our cells, it's sitting around the outside of our cells, which is called interstitial fluid. So we really have those sort of three components. Um, and the way all our cells in our body work is that they have little pumps on them that actively kick sodium out. So we have very little sodium inside our cells and quite a lot of sodium outside our cells. And that actually has a really important function in terms of the way that water moves between the inside and the outside of our cells as things change in terms of eating food, drinking water, or you know some combination of those if we get dehydrated and so on. Um, so with sodium, it's of all the minerals in the extracellular fluid, so in the blood and in the interstitial fluid, it's the one that's there in the largest quantity. Right. And so it has the biggest influence over that shift of water between the inside and the outside of our cells. And that's absolutely crucial to make sure our cells don't shrink too small and cause problems from a health perspective or, you know, get so big that they can cause problems from yes. being too big as well, um, both of which are, are not very good from a human health perspective. Yeah, so in fact, if we do talk about that next, it would be good to discuss what happens when hydration goes wrong. So mm -hmm. when we don't have enough fluid in our body and we become dehydrated or we overhydrate and suffer from hyponatremia. So can yep. you explain to us what, what happens in those situations? Yeah, and I think before I do that, I think the first thing I'd say is both those situations are pretty rare, certainly yeah. from a, a life-threatening perspective. Um, our body's got very good checks and balances to try and prevent either of those scenarios from occurring, and you know, sodium plays a, a role in that as well. Um, so the first thing is if we become dehydrated for whatever reason, whether that's because we've been sweating profusely and not drinking anything, although usually we've got access to some fluid that that's not going to be, you know, to that sort of life-threatening um, scenario. More likely it's because we've been lost out in the wilderness yeah. or, or something like that for days uh, on end. That's where it might get a little bit more serious. Um, so what's going to happen is as we lose water, the amount of um, sodium as a concentration in our blood will rise uh, and that does a couple of things. So I guess in terms of what I say, concentration of sodium in our blood, I guess the, probably the easiest way to visualise this for people who you know, don't have their head around that is to think of like a glass of cordial. So you've got the water and then you've got the cordial. Um, and the cordial in this case is the sodium. So, you know, you can tip more cordial in and it'll become darker or more concentrated or you can add more water in and it'll become weaker and more diluted kind of thing. So you've got that sort of balance going on and that's what the body wants to keep within a quite a narrow range. So how concentrated, you know, what colour the cordial is, uh, how dark or light it is, that's the thing that the body wants to keep fairly constant within a pretty tight range. So what's going to happen is if we're dehydrated, some of that sodium will uh, increase so it'll become more concentrated, darker cordial if you like. Um, and then what usually will happen is it sends a signal to our brain and that'll do two things. One, it'll make us feel thirsty. So that gives us the sensation of thirst. We want to go looking for water to, to drink. Uh, but the other thing it does is it acts on the kidneys. And the kidneys are the, the thing that regulates how much water and how much sodium we lose out of the body uh, in ordinary circumstances. So um, both of those things can be um, conserved independently yeah. of each other. So we can conserve water but not and get rid of the excess salt yeah. or we can get rid of... Um, water and, and retain salt as well, right. depending on you know, the scenario. So it's fairly tightly reg regulated. Yeah, yeah. It only yeah. takes a, a shift of you know, a few percent in what we call the plasma osmolality. Essentially, mm -hmm. it's a measure of the concentration of the yeah. um, sodium, but other things as well. But the sodium is the main one in our blood uh, before little triggers go off in our brain that start to make us thirsty and release that antidiuretic hormone. It's a hormone that acts on the kidneys um, to either retain or get rid of mm -hmm. excess water, depending on the scenario. Um, so most of the time, uh, you know, if we're not doing huge amounts of exercise, if we've got access to fluid, all that kind of thing, those checks and balances do a really good job 
of keeping everything in check. You know, yeah. we, we, we're thirsty, we drink something, it keeps us you know, hydrated, you know, maybe not perfect if you, if you want to call it that, uh, but, you know, not to any sort of level that would be harmful to, to health or life-threatening or anything like that. Um, so that's kind of the dehydration side of things. Obviously, yes. if you don't have access to fluid, um, things can go a little bit wrong. Uh, or if you're profusely sweating for a long period of time in the context of exercise, that changes things a little bit as well because now we're losing fluid and sodium through our sweat glands yes. um, rather than um, just through our kidneys. And our kidneys will adjust to that. So if we're sweating profusely, we're probably not going to be peeing very much or producing yeah. much urine because our kidneys are saying, well, hang on, it's all been lost yeah. over here. Let's let's re retain it here because we don't want to lose it from both places. Yeah, exactly right. So that's kind of the dehydration side of things. Um, the hyponatremia you mentioned is kind of the, the opposite to that. Yes. So hyponatremia by definition, if you sort of break down that word, hypo means low, nat means sodium, and emia means blood. So it's basically low concentration of sodium in the blood. Right. Um, so if you, uh, you know, take a blood sample in a lab and, and analyse it for the sodium concentration, hyponatremia would be, you know, what's considered below the, the normal mm. um, concentration for sodium. So generally below 135 millimoles per litre is kind of the So very the weak, cordial. Exactly, exactly. So then the question is, why is the cordial weak? Is the cordial weak because there's not enough salt or is the cordial weak because we've put too much water in? Mm. Um, and 99% of the time in, in an exercise environment anyway, it's because we've put too much water in. Yeah. So hyponatremia is generally caused by drinking too much fluid during exercise. So, you know, we're sweating out however much we're sweating out. We're drinking however much we're drinking, but whatever we're drinking, it's too much compared to what yeah. we're sweating out. And so that fluid's accumulating in the body. I've read that it's most likely in a situation where the weather's not too hot and mm -hmm. someone's competing for a long period of time and yep. um, perhaps going slowly and just, you know, has really taken heed of this drink while you exercise message, but taken it a bit far and just... Um, Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's by far the most common. Uh, it tends to be, if you look you know, at a particular event, like an ultra marathon or something like that, it's the most common, as you said, in cooler weather, but also in the slowest runners, yes. uh, in the smallest runners as well. So females are disproportionately more affected than males just because of body size, not because it's a specific gender thing, but mainly because if you're 50 kilos, it's easy, it's easier to pour yeah. too much water into a 50 kilo body than it is into a 90 kilo body. Yeah. And as you said, um, we should emphasise it's very rare, isn't it, for this to actually yes. happen? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and even if it does, most of the time it's not um, it's not to the stage that it causes major health problems. Mm. So there are, for example, studies where they've gone to an event, like a, a race of some kind that's a triathlon or an ultramarathon or something, and actually taken blood samples just randomly for people just to see how much of a problem mm. it is. Uh, and there have been events where the the, um, the incidence is as high as, you know, 15, 20% of people have oh, right. hyponatremia. That's unusual. Not, not all studies find that. Um, but that said, often it's very mild hyponatremia to the extent that no one would have ever known they even had hyponatremia had right. they not had the blood test. So they so don't have any clinical. symptoms. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no signs or symptoms right. of, of hyponatremia. Okay. Um, and then presumably the kidneys will fix everything up over the next day. Well, they usually do. Yeah, they usually do. Um, the problem is when the kidneys don't fix things up and that's when things can go wrong. So oh. most of the time, even during exercise for, for a lot of people, like you drink too much, well, you just have to pee. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's inconvenient, it's annoying and because you have to stop you know, running or yeah. riding or whatever and, and pee or you know, depending on the event, you might go just while you're on the move. Um, <laughs> You'd have to be pretty good in my opinion to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you see it... Um, yeah, in pro cycling, you know, either stopping by the side of the thing or someone pushes them along and while they go off the side of the bike kind of thing. Oh, right, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that does happen. Um, but it's it's when the kidneys are inappropriately retaining fluid when they should be getting rid of it that problems start to occur because okay. then that fluid starts to build up. Or if you drink a huge amount of water very quickly, you, you're pouring the water in faster than the kidneys can remove the excess. Uh, and there has been a couple of examples of that um, in America, actually, with American footballers who uh, were told that they were cramping because they were dehydrated. So the coach told them to 
to you know turn up to training better hydrated and they took that message way too far just drank well you know in american terms gallons and gallons of water (laughs) and actually developed hyponatremia without doing any exercise you know before they even got to training Oh, that's yeah. really unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah, Gosh. yeah, exactly um, right. Um, but yeah, in terms of what happens then, if you get that build up of water, um, yeah, as I said, it dilutes the sodium because you have that low blood sodium. What that's going to do is then shift that water from the extracellular, like from in the blood, to the cells to try and balance out the concentration between what's in the cell and outside the cell. And so you get this shift; that excess fluid is shifting into the cell. So and then the cells start to swell, swell up. up? Do you, do, yeah. Do people yeah, noticeably they're... swell up? I mean, can they? Uh, it, it depends on the person. Right. Um, some people do, like they notice, you know, quite puffy hands and feet mm. and that kind of thing. Um, but where it gets kind of really serious from a medical point of view is it starts to build up around the lungs and people get short of breath. Okay. Um, but the, the super dangerous part is then getting swelling in around, around the brain because your, right. your skull's obviously a fixed size yes. and if things start to swell within your skull there's no room for the brain to mm. expand and so it starts to get kind of crushed a little bit and and getting damage occurring and that's you know um, unfortunately there are documented cases probably about 15 cases i think now of people who have died from hypernatremia right. you know, during or following exercise yeah um, uh, but as i said you know 15 people since i think 1981 when the first yeah. one was sort of recognized millions and millions exactly of people who have competed that's right. And I mean, there are other people that have been unwell and been in hospital for, for days after an event. Uh, but again, that's rare. Whilst we're on the topic of endurance sport, I'll mention my review of the book, How Bad Do You Want It? Mastering the Psychology of Mind Over Muscle by Matt Fitzgerald, one of my favourite authors. Fitzgerald's book examines the proposition, the greatest athletic performances take place in the mind, not the body. He supports this statement with scientific evidence and by engagingly describing epic moments in endurance sports where champions have overcome physical limitations with mental might. To find my review of the book and a link to buy it if you want to, go to the books page on my website and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Alan, if we imagine that uh, we've got an athlete who is about to compete in a long event, so it could be a marathon, an ultramarathon, an Ironman or something like that, is there anything special they need to do to prepare before the event in terms of their hydration? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's a, probably a couple of components to this. One of it is sort of knowing what your expected sort of hydration needs are going to be mm-hmm. before you start. Um there's a couple of schools of thought around sort of fluid and sodium replacement during exercise. And that debate has been pretty controversial at times and, you know, sort of academics throwing stones over the wall at each other type thing. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So one school of thought would say, we want to know, you know, how much fluid you lose per hour of of that kind of exercise. Right. So I can plan how much I'm going to drink and, Mm -hmm. and the same with sodium, you can do testing to actually, I mean, that's, part of what I did in my PhD was, you know, stick patches on people, collect yeah. samples of their sweat, and work out how much sodium they're losing in their sweat during exercise. And uh, so some people will then say, okay, well, you know, I'm losing, I don't know, 500 milligrams an hour or whatever it is. So I should be consuming 500 milligrams an hour during exercise. So that's kind of one approach is that really mm-hmm. test and targeted replacement yeah. component. Uh, and then the other school of thought is, well, the body pretty much figures it out anyway. Thirst is a good mechanism. Drink when you're thirsty. Don't drink when you're not thirsty because you might overdrink. Um, and sodium is not particularly, you know, you lose some sodium, but it's not doesn't really have any major consequence during exercise. Um, so there's kind of these two sort of competing schools of thought. Uh, I guess in terms of how I think about it, um, I think having a rigid plan around uh, particularly the volume of fluid that you drink is potentially fraught with danger yeah. uh, in terms of either both underhydrating or overhydrating during exercise. So if you uh, do you know, a test and you can do this by weighing yourself before and after exercise and seeing how much weight you lose to work out your sweat loss, mm-hmm. um, you might say, okay, well, you know, I'm 600 mils an hour was my number. Um, And so some people really cling on to that number and go, I'm a 600 mil an hour person. Well, if the weather's 10 degrees warmer tomorrow, you might be an 800 mil an hour person that day. 
or if uh, you know it's a shorter race, so you run faster, your body generates more body heat, you're going to sweat more, and so now yeah. you're a nine, you know, a liter an hour person, uh, or it's a particularly cold day and you're a 300 mil an hour person. So uh, having that one number and holding on to it, it's not that simple. Yeah, um, I can see how that could create a problem, and then it could also lead to some stress because. Yes. The athletes, you know, may be thinking, oh, I have to drink this much, but I'm not feeling thirsty. And, and so they're um, forced, forced yeah. drinking, yeah. Well, it's interesting, though, because, I mean, you're probably often dealing with elite athletes, but for someone like me who just goes out there and does it for the fun of it, I mean, I've never had any sort of plan. I, I mean, I have a plan with my nutrition and I drink to thirst. Yeah. Um, but I've never actually had a plan about replacing sodium um i'm thinking maybe now i should <laughs> yeah well i mean I haven't. I, yeah i mean even just to finish up on the fluid side of things as well yeah. i think um you know if you think about something like an ironman or an ultra marathon you know those events go for 10 plus hours for a yes. lot of people so your sweat loss is going to change over that time even like if you oh, start a race at six or seven o'clock in the morning it could be 10 degrees celsius and then in the middle of the day, it could be 30 degrees Celsius. And then it could go back to, you know, 16 or 17 by the end of the day. So yeah. even if you stayed at exactly the same speed throughout the entire thing, it's likely that your sweat rate is going to change over that time. So I guess the way I would think about that, um, that you know, 600 mils an hour or whatever it is, if you do a test, is firstly, if you're doing that test, you need to replicate race conditions as closely as possible yeah, um, to, to try and arrive at some number that's, you know, roughly there. Uh, the second thing I would say is that number is never a, a set in stone number, as I've just sort of explained. Uh, it's kind of a, a ballpark. And, and the other thing I would do is, um, you know, test it in different, you know, test it in the morning, test it in the middle of the day so you get a sense of how much that, that varies for you. Uh, and then the third thing is how you use that number. So rather than saying, I will drink 600 mils an hour because that was my loss, Instead, I tend to think of it in terms of, okay, well, I might have tested myself a few times. I know it's probably somewhere between 500 and 900 mils an hour, depending on you know, the day, the weather, all that kind of stuff. I need to make sure I've got access to 900 mils of fluid an hour because I may well feel thirsty and want to drink that much, but I may not either. And so I tend to use that number in terms of planning how much fluid I need access yeah, okay. to as opposed to how much I will drink. And then letting letting thirst kind of guide you in terms of how much to drink of the fluid that you do have available to you. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of framing it, having access to the fluid, because mm. then um, you're not going to feel stressed as an athlete because you've you've planned it. You know where the aid stations are. You, depending on what event you're doing, you might be carrying a hydration pack, so you know you've got enough. Yeah, and I think you still need that number to you know, prevent you from, from over-drinking excessively too because yeah. there are examples uh, of people that ended up with hyponatremia and then when they sort of looked back and said, well, why did you drink all this fluid? They said, because I was thirsty and I wanted to. Um, so there are examples, you know, documented examples of people who've developed hyponatremia, quote, unquote, drinking to thirst, you know, whatever that meant for them. Um, and so... Yeah, I think for, to some degree that needs to be sort of taken into account and, and possibly also thought about when you're doing that kind of testing to work out what your sweat losses are is make a bit of a note of you know, how thirsty do you feel yeah. um, because are you someone who, you know, thirsty is a pretty good guide and, and pretty well matches up what you're losing or are you someone who thirst doesn't seem to be a very good guide um, and I think it's kind of ironic the the, the big sort of consensus paper around preventing hyponatremia during exercise um the the crux of that paper there's this little nice little diagram towards the end of it that says the strategy is drinking to thirst that will prevent <laughs> you from getting hyponatremia okay okay yeah and they've got the, you know rationale for it and everything yes, in there and then you go back one page the previous page and there's a table with i think about five documented examples in the peer-reviewed literature of people who got hyponatremia from drinking to thirst clearly there's no obvious answer is there you know the no, people no. basically i think need to as you say test it out so test out how much you need in different conditions and and give and work out a range i think 
Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, thirst is for most people in most circumstances is going to be a pretty good guide. Um, yeah. But there does seem to be some examples for whatever reason, if it's you know a side effect of medication or you know, whatever, or just the way that people interpret how they're feeling. And, you know, if it's a dry throat, you know, dry mouth from breathing heavily or whatever, if it's different in dry weather versus humid weather or, or whatever it is, um, there are cases that it's gone wrong. But I guess the flip side of that is, you know, you're 12 hours into an ultra marathon. How do you know whether you've drunk enough or not? Yeah, that's true. Because you're not going to whip out a set of scales and weigh yourself. No. Um, and no. they're, they're doing all the calculations. How much food did I eat? Have I been to the toilet to you know, correct the weight difference? And also uh, when you say you are at an aid station and you grab a glass of water, you actually don't know how much you're drinking because some of it spills. Correct. You pour some on yep. your head because you're hot and you want to cool yourself yep. down. So it would be almost impossible to work correct. out precisely how much exactly right drinking. and so with with those numbers i always say it's it's a ballpark it's yeah. something to start with um at the end of the day like what are you going to use what's the dipstick you're putting into the engine to work out you know where you're at at any point in time during a race and really thirst the only one we've got yeah yeah that makes sense and of course um, we won't go into it all but you're also combining that with nutrition and there's a lot of stuff going on there isn't there it's yeah. it's um, for the athlete to think about so we're talking about thirst and and sweating what what's the physiological function of sweating yeah so uh, sweating has a, a few different purposes uh, and that depends possibly also if it's during exercise or not so uh, a lot of people aren't aware that sweat actually has a a role in terms of the immune system as well so oh, some of that. the components yeah in sweat that uh, ends up on the skin surface has a role in, in supporting our immune system and stopping harmful bits and pieces uh, getting in. And obviously the skin's our first barrier to you know, stopping the outside world getting into our body. So it kind of makes sense that there's some involvement there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not the one that we tend to think of in the context of exercise. Uh, that's more around how our body cools down. And it's yeah. one of the things that... Um, it's not completely unique in humans, but it's it's fairly unusual in the animal kingdom that yes. um, animals sweat. You know, some animals, like horses, for example, can sweat, uh, but not nearly to the same extent that humans can. Um, and so you see, you know, for example, dogs that are running around after a while, they just sort of collapse in a heap and they're sitting yeah. there panting. And the reason for that is that's the only way they can get rid of all the excess heat their bodies generated from running around. Uh, whereas humans, we have this ability to produce sweat basically put a film of water onto our skin and then let that water evaporate off. And as it evaporates off, that removes energy, basically heat from our, our body. So every time, you know, we contract a muscle, we're producing energy uh, and a good portion of that energy is basically heat as a byproduct of that, that energy production. So all that heat has to go somewhere. Our body likes to keep its temperature pretty mm. stable um, and so we need to get rid of that excess heat uh, and so during exercise we're producing so much heat because we're you know not just resting or, so or walking hard, yeah. yeah exactly so uh, sweating is the is the most efficient way of doing that is to evaporate it off our skin surface well, one thing I found really interesting was I lived in Hong Kong for 10 years and it's mm. really humid yes. over there it's about usually around 98 percent and um, Hong Kong is also an excellent city for trail running it's absolutely i was about to say that yeah and yeah. it's one of the things that people don't expect yeah. but as soon as you talk to people who live there they're like there's a massive trail scene over there it is absolutely great and i loved it and i really got into it but one thing over there that is really hard is that you sweat a lot because it's mm. so humid but it doesn't evaporate yes. so you get really really hot um yeah and you end up having to pour water on your head and things like that just to help your body cool down. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, basically for, for sweat to evaporate off your skin surface, uh, there has to be a difference in the humidity of the air and the humidity of the skin. And the, the smaller that difference is, the less effective the evaporation becomes. Yeah. So the more humid the air is, yeah, the, the less effective evaporation is at, at cooling you down. And so it's not necessarily that you sweat more, although sometimes that can be the case, but it's more that sweat just sits on the skin surface doesn't and doesn't evaporate off. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, I did a race in Myanmar. It was a, well, I did a half marathon, but there was also a full marathon there. And 
um, it was really interesting because there was quite a few of us who had come over from other cities in Asia. So we'd all trained in mm. the heat. We we're all really used to it. There was a couple of people who had come over from a US winter and um, a couple of people ended up being taken away in ambulances because I think they just got this heat exhaustion yep. from, you know, those extreme, that extreme um, humidity over there. Yeah, well, your body goes through a whole bunch of processes uh, when you're exposed to a hot climate that adapts it to be better at dealing with that hot climate. So if you come straight over, yeah, from, from winter and you don't take time to acclimatise or yeah. do what we call acclimation, which is like, you know, art, uh, exercising in artificial heat before just before you leave, uh, then yeah, you have a smaller blood volume. You don't sweat as much. Uh, the sweat that you do have has more sodium in it. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. You know, your your resting body temperature is higher. Your resting heart rate is higher. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of issues there. That's why elite athletes would go and acclimatize first, isn't it? Yes, or, or acclimate. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, if, find the conditions so, yeah. at home. Yeah. yeah, so if you can travel, you know, a good couple of weeks beforehand, then you can do that. If you don't have that luxury for whatever reason, uh, you can you can acclimate. So that's basically where you're exercising in an artificially hot environment mm. for, you know, probably a good hour or two at a time for, uh, you know, every day for almost two weeks. I believe people sweat at very different rates. Is that is that true? Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's been a, a bit of work, actually, more sort of pure physiology type work rather than the applied sports science work that's uh, sort of looked at what accounts for these differences. Uh, and it seems to be that the main differences or what explains the difference in sweat rate between people is basically the amount of evaporation that needs to occur to maintain a constant, you know, maintain a, a normal body temperature. Uh, so the more evaporation someone needs to maintain that body mm -hmm. temperature, the more sweat they'll produce because they need to evaporate it off uh, and vice versa. So bigger people uh, will produce, you know, there's more of them, so they'll produce yeah. more body heat. Uh, and also it's to do with the body surface area compared yeah. to the volume, that ratio. Um, so they'll need um, more evaporation to get rid of that excess heat because um, they produce more of it and, and struggle to get rid of it as much. So they'll produce more sweat than a smaller person. But even within a person, you know, your sweat rate will change depending oh, on absolutely. weather, depending on clothing, depending on the exercise intensity, all of those kinds of things. But just to give you an example, you know, in, in one of my PhD these studies so we have people exercising in exactly the same temperature doing exactly the same exercise uh, and we saw a range of sweat rates from probably six or seven hundred mils an hour right up to about 1800 mils an hour oh, right. for the same exercise oh, that's three times as much yeah. yeah um is there a gender difference or is it yes and no um generally you'll see a, a lower sweat rate in females compared to males for the same exercise uh, but it's not a gender specific effect it's a body size shape okay. body mass yeah, specific effect yeah. so yeah if, if you take that out of the equation if you look at body surface area if you look at body mass and take those out of the equation there doesn't seem to be any difference between males so and females if you had a man and a woman that weighed the same and had fairly similar physiques then they're likely to sweat at a similar sort of rate yes yeah. what is there a genetic component to it do we know or not uh, no, it seems to be purely around that you know, that need for a certain level of evaporation to maintain yeah. body temperature it seems to account for almost all of the variation either okay. between people or within people doing different activities. The next question I ask Alan is how does dietary sodium play into all of this? Do athletes have different sodium requirements in their diet compared to the average person who maybe just walks a few times a week? Question. Um, I think day to day, probably not because our kidneys do a very good job of either conserving sodium if we need more or getting rid of the excess if we need, you know, if we're having too much in our diet. So I think day to day, the answer is probably no. Uh, the only time that that might be an exception to that is during that sort of ultra endurance exercise yeah. where you could be losing, you know, huge amounts of sodium over 10, 15, 20 hours without the ability to completely replace it or, you know, deliberate choice not to replace it. Um, because of the sweat loss, but you know, day to day, our kidneys do a good job of yeah. um, uh, of you know sort of filtering that out. And what happens is 
after about two or three days of changing the amount of salt in your diet, like if you suddenly went on a really low salt diet, people were like, oh, you know, I'm going to be losing all this sodium in my sweat and I'm not replacing it, what's going to happen? But your sweat glands actually adapt to that. Um, and so they'll recognise the fact that, you know, there's not much coming in. So they'll actually start conserving sodium just like your kidneys do. Um, there's a bit more of a delay with the sweat glands, which right. is like a, why a one-off ultra marathon could potentially be an issue. Uh, but over you know consecutive days or weeks of training, yeah. um, generally your sweat glands will adapt um, to you know the type of exercise you're doing, the amount that you're sweating, what your kidneys are able to do in in response to that outside of exercise, uh, and your diet, you know, how much sodium is coming in. Yeah, and given that most people who sign up for an ultra endurance event are actually going to do quite a lot of training in the lead up that gives mm. your body then time to adapt. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So we're doing a study at the moment at, at Monash where we're getting people to run for five hours uh, on the treadmill in the heat. <laughs> what fun. And yeah. Yeah. We're having trouble recruiting for that one. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. Um, but then we're also looking at what the kidneys do in the 24 hours afterwards. So how they can sort of compensate depending on whether, so in this study, we, we sweat test them first and then we get them to run for the five hours and either give them all of the sodium that they're losing mm -hmm. or none. And then okay. we, um, we look at a bunch of things that happen during exercise, but we're also interested in what's happening after exercise for the next day, particularly thinking about those kind of multi-stage events where the yeah. people might be, you know, running on consecutive days for a really long time. And if you don't replace all of that sodium on day one, what happens on day two? You know, are your kidneys so, able to keep up with that and, and compensate for that? Uh, in that study that you're doing at the moment, do you, for the next 24 hours when you're monitoring the athletes, do they have a specific diet that they have? To uh, we we provide they... all the food yeah. so we know how much sodium so they're getting. Keep it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just keeping um, the conditions steady. And we also give them water in bottles so we can actually track how much they're drinking yep. over that period. And they, they collect literally every drop of urine they produce during that period as well, which I then have the, <laughs> oh, me and some other students have the, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, they get funnels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, some uh, students and myself have the, the pleasant task of analyzing liters of, of urine <laughs> when it comes back. Oh, the joys. Mm. If someone has, you know, been to see you as a client, for example, done some testing and they know, for example, that they need to take some sodium on board during an endurance race, how would you recommend they do that? Should they should they take sodium tablets or in a drink or what? What, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, it's it's to be honest, it's kind of the million dollar question in terms of okay, well I've perceived there's an issue, or I've gone out and done a test and worked out what my sodium loss is you know, per liter of sweat or per hour of exercise. Okay, you've got this number now. What do you do with it? Mm. Um, and there's really not much guidance out there, to be honest. And, and the reason is that no one's really studied it. That five-hour study is really an attempt to look at, at this specific issue, um, you know, that post-exercise thing aside. Yeah. So one of the things, like if you go and look back through the, the main sports nutrition guidelines from the, you know, the American College of Sports Medicine, for example, you get to the bit around sodium and it's kind of really vague. It kind of says, oh, you should, you know, if you lose lots of sodium, you probably should replace it. It doesn't say doesn't say how it gives you a little bit of guidance about yeah. what a lot is but it doesn't say how you should replace it. it doesn't say how much of the loss you should replace or in what form or anything like that um and as i said it's it's not a knock on the the people who write those guidelines it's just the lack of it research they've got to yeah. yeah exactly right so um so that's what we're kind of trying to look at at the moment so yeah i guess there's a, a couple of parts to this one is how much and then the yeah. second part is in what format or, or how do you sort of achieve that and i think in terms of the how much part i guess and this was kind of the the learnings from that uh from the first obviously you know we haven't finished it yet but that five hour study and, mm -hmm. and just the first component of that is when when we're exercising you know, we can do a sweat test and say we lose 500 milligrams an hour. And so we, in the study, make up capsules to exactly the amount that they lost in their test. Yep. So 500 milligrams, milligrams an hour, 600, whatever it is, and then they take that. And that's literally, as far as I can tell, the first time anyone's ever actually personalised the replacement in a study. They just normally give the same to everyone. Oh, that's which, fascinating. Yeah, which is not yeah. what actually happens. Um so, yeah, so we're doing this sort of personalised replacement and then and see what happens. 
one of the things we were interested in is whether we give people salt or not, does it make them drink more or less? Yeah. Um, and does it make them drink too much? Um, because that has been a theory amongst okay. some researchers is if you replace all of your sodium loss, it actually makes you so thirsty, you drink too much, and then you actually may develop hyponatremia because you drank too much. Yeah. Uh, we certainly haven't seen that. Um, I mean, we're blinded, so we don't know who's on the, you know, the high salt diet and the placebo uh, capsules during yes. the exercise. But we can see from the data that no one's like excessively drinking on either Right. either diet but we also know they're not replacing 100 percent of their fluid losses so when we think about this in terms of how we recommend the sodium replacement so normally we tend to think uh, or traditionally people have thought in milligrams per hour so you know i'm going to get 500 milligrams of sodium every hour of my race mm -hmm. but what we're seeing with this is if you replaced 100 percent of your sodium losses in that context but you only drink i don't know 70 percent of your fluid losses you've now got a mismatch because you're putting back the fluid and the sodium, but you're putting back proportionally more it's sodium different. than you did yeah. with the fluid. And so you probably end up over supplementing with sodium. Uh, and that may or may uh, not, we don't really know yet, but may so cause it's very issues in nuanced. itself. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking now is that possibly from a recommendation point of view, rather than thinking about it in terms of milligrams of sodium per hour of exercise, instead, just go back to our sweat test result. Don't even bother doing all those calculations. Just get the concentration from the sample. Yeah. And if it's 50, milli, you know, 50 millimoles per litre or, you know, 800 milligrams yeah. per litre or whatever it is, replace that. Cordial. So basically, yeah, exactly right. Exactly strength. right. So it's yeah. a like-for-like -like replacement yeah. of what you lost. So you're then saying, okay, well, uh, you know, I, I, in my sweat, I lose 800 milligrams for every litre of sweat. So for every litre of fluid I drink, I'm going to try and get 800 milligrams yeah. of sodium along with that. It um, does sound very practical. Yeah, and basically what it means is, you know, particularly if you're using thirst to guide your drinking strategy, is yeah. that today you might replace 70% of your fluid losses, tomorrow it might be 90%, the next day it might be 80%. Mm, but and you're that, not getting that mismatch then. Exactly, the because if you, if you um, – plan the sodium based on the amount of fluid you drink it means that if you replace 70 percent of your fluid you replace 70 percent of your sodium yeah. if you replace 90 percent of your fluid you replace 90 percent of your sodium as well so it keeps the two in balance yeah it sounds like um, just listening to you talk it sounds like um, sort of at the elite level sports nutrition is incredibly personalized or can be incredibly personalized certainly can be yeah, yeah. It, it it isn't always uh but, you know, I guess the more resources you have, the more you can do those kind of things. Um, I guess the other thing we need to think about, though, is sometimes are we over-personalising things? Are we over-complicating yeah. things? Because, you know, athletes are still people. They've got their whole mental preparation. They've got, you know, whatever, you know, depending on what sort of sport they're doing, their equipment and that side of things. There's the yeah. coaching side. There's the physical preparation and warm-up side of stuff. There's so much going on. Yeah, it's a jigsaw puzzle, isn't that, it? And yeah. this is, I guess, we're drilling down into one specific part of that puzzle. But the more things you get right, the better chances you have of success in the long run, I think. Correct. But you don't want to, at the same time, overcomplicate it and try yeah. and do so many things that yeah. you can't do any of them right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Mm. So you sort or of have the, to pick one of the, the important get, things. Get so confused by all the different things they're trying to juggle and think about that they just, you know, freak out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I, I guess from that perspective, um, it's then also thinking about okay, well, what events do we actually need to worry about this whole sodium business, and what events does it probably make no difference whatsoever? Yeah, of course. So it's mainly the longer events. Exactly. When you can accumulate that big sodium loss over yeah. a long period of time. And uh, when, if you just drank water, you're getting that mismatch between the fluid replacement and sodium replacement. Obviously, the longer that goes on for, the bigger that mismatch yes. becomes. Um, there are some people that have sort of suggested, well, our body has stores of sodium in our skin and we'll probably just release those to, to protect ourselves. Um, it's a good theory. Uh, I don't disagree with it, but I don't think anyone's actually done a study know. to show it either way yeah yeah so yeah. It's, it's sort of a bit of an unknown at the moment and again we're hoping that we might be able to show evidence of that occurring or not occurring uh, from this five-hour study but we'll we'll have to wait and see oh well, that's really interesting stuff you're on the cutting edge, edge there of um i hope so yeah science i just want to quickly um 
because I, you probably need to get back to your family, Alan, just quickly touch on hydration and cramp. A lot of people have the perception that cramps and hydration are related and that cramp is caused by a lack of sodium. Is, is there any truth in that? It's one of those long and confusing theories, myths, research evidence, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that goes back almost 100 years now, actually, to the sort of the early 1920s when a lot of this started to get studied in people that were working mainly in mines, actually, um, and this sort of relationship between salt, water and cramping. The hardest thing with cramp by far is the fact that it's unpredictable in nature. So yes. we can't just bring you into the lab and say, right, Amanda, when I count to three, can you just cramp <laughs> for me and we'll measure it? It's not going to work like that. So it does make it really difficult to study. And so what yes. you tend to see when you look at cramping research is two things. One is they either turn up to a race, recruit a whole bunch of people, uh, ask them after the race, did you cramp? Yes. How bad was it? And then try and do some sort of assessment of mm -hmm. you know, the people who did cramp, the people who didn't cramp, what was different between those two yeah. groups of people. Uh, and, you know, you might find 200 people in your study and only 20 of them cramped at best. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of potluck what you're going to find, I guess, in some of those kind of studies. But when you look at that research, it would suggest that uh, hydration is no different between the people who cramped and the ones who didn't. The amount right. of sodium consumed makes no difference, etc. Etc. Okay. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a difference there. The second part of the research that's um, been looked at, probably more so in the last 10 years, maybe 15, is trying to develop a lab model where we can predictably, uh, predictably make people cramp and then we can try and alter things and see if we can change how likely they are to cramp yeah. or not. So it's it's a pretty sort of tortuous type thing. I was going to so say that might be a hard one to recruit people for as well. <laughs> yeah, I've never done one, so I don't know yeah, how, how difficult or how easy it is, it is. Yeah. or what uh, sort of incentives you have to put on the table to get people to agree. Yeah. Um, but often it's just like your little toe, they'll make your little toe cramp and then because okay. yeah, it's kind of pretty mechanistic. That's bearable, nature. yeah. Yeah, some of the, I, mean, I have seen some where it's been like calf cramps. Oh, um, ouch. That's a bit more severe, yeah. Mm. Um, but basically what they do is they put little electrodes placed on a, a particular nerve that controls, you know, muscle contractions of whatever, you know, muscle is being studied and then they'll send electric pulses through it and basically zap you Um and what they're doing is basically zapping you until you cramp. And so they'll have like this, um, what they call like a threshold frequency. How much zapping did you need before you started to cramp? And then they can change things, change your hydration status, okay. change you know, your warm up or oh, sodium. Or it's a different if it changes of, the threshold yeah. for cramping. Yeah, okay. exactly right. Uh, and again, you know, most of those studies, you, you don't see a, a big difference in terms of, um, you know, sodium concentration in the blood or in terms of hydration status and that kind of thing okay. uh, but there has been a bit of interesting research just in the last 12 months it's kind of looked at a looked at this from a slightly different angle around sodium and hydration so what they've um, done is said okay well you know you develop dehydration or, or overhydration or whatever it is kind of progressively over time you know you mm -hmm. sweat out over two three four hours you drink you know it's some sort of mismatch uh, either over or under over a period of time uh, and at some time along that point people cramp and you know that mismatch doesn't seem to be obvious um, but what they did notice is uh, in one study done over in, in western australia is that if you've um become sort of progressively dehydrated over a period of time. So your, your blood sodium has kind of gone up. Mm -hmm. That cordial is, is darker or more yeah. concentrated. And then you suddenly dilute it with a lot of water in a pretty rapid period of time. That does seem to lower the threshold for cramping. Okay. Um, and I wonder whether, because often you see people cramp even after the race is finished, you know, half yes. an hour, an hour later. Uh, and I suspect that this may be, part of the reason in some people yeah, is that they finish the race, up. they cross the finish line and then they, they drink a whole bunch of plain down. water. Yeah. And then, then they start to cramp. Then they cramp. So, yeah, I mean, it's only been one small study at this stage. I think there's another one um, in not in exercise cramping, just in a general sort of cramping model that kind of suggests something similar. Uh, there are studies actually, and going back to the miners, some of them that did uh, be more predisposed to cramping uh, were the ones who actually, if anything, hyponatremic. Uh, so maybe too much fluid rather than not okay. enough. Uh, 
uh, or, you know, blood sodium too low. And, and so there's been a, a little bit of speculation about, you know, what's going on in the body that leads this situation to increase people's cramping risk. Uh, for me, it may be the sudden shift of fluid from the outside to the inside of the cell mm. is doing something. Um, but, yeah, we don't really know still for sure. And I think if anyone tells you they know the the, the fix for all cramping in exercise, they're lying, frankly. They're lying. So, yeah. so watch this space. Do yeah. you have any actual practical um, advice? If, if an athlete's uh, running, for example, and they cramp up, what should they do? Yeah, well, I mean, the, thing, the main thing that will relieve cramping when it occurs is stretching the muscle. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the first thing. And I think, what I yeah, find. Um, and that comes back to the fact that, you know, you can muck around with the sodium and the fluid all you want. And, yes, it might change uh, the risk of cramping if you suddenly scull a lot of water having not drank much for a long time. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are other factors that are probably bigger and more important, and that might be one risk factor, but it's only one risk factor yeah. for cramping. Uh, that said, from a nutrition point of view, if you wanted to do something about it, I guess from a prevention point of view would be making sure that you drink sort of evenly across the race yeah. and not just, you know, waiting till you're two hours in and then starting to, you know, scull lots of fluid. Um, if you are going to do that, then, you know, that fluid probably should have some sodium in it. Um, so you're not diluting that cordial as as dramatically in yeah. that short period of time. Um, and if you are cramping at the time, from a nutrition point of view, what can you do? Well, probably not a lot. Uh, there's a few yeah. sort of pills and potions out there that you know have sort of shown potential promise but never really amounted to much. And they would probably, I mean, they're not going to have an immediate effect in any event, are they? they need yeah, there was a couple of things like, you, and... no, there are things like pickle juice uh, and another product in the US oh, called Hot Shots right. that kind of claimed to yes. to settle down cramping pretty quickly. And there was a little bit of early research in some of those things, but um, I certainly don't think they're a universal solution for everyone. And I think we should probably try and land this plane now, Alan. But yep. before I ask my final question, I would like to quickly ask you about my mountain biking because I believe yep. that's what you do. That's your exercise of choice. Uh, at, not, at the not much at the moment. Oh, um, no? I know riding with my six-year-old to and from school is probably <laughs> most of my mountain oh, bike gets okay. a workout at the moment. But, yes, it has been over the last 10 years, yeah. So kids aside, if, if, you, weren't, if you didn't have a young child or children, yes. that's what you'd be doing? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah, kids kids can sort of get in the way of some of our um, favourite activities like that for a little while. <laughs> well, he's starting to ride a fair bit. You know, he could ride about 10 or 15 Ks himself. So, you know, obviously pretty flat at the moment and with no, no technical bits and pieces, yeah. but obviously as he gets older, Watch yeah, out, hopefully Dad. I'll be able to <laughs> get out onto some real trails with him, which will be That'll fun. Be cool. Alan, the final question that I ask all my guests is if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? Good question. Um, probably a couple of things. The first one is something that I need to do a lot more of, and that's get a good night's sleep. Oh, yeah, that's so important. Yeah, and I think at the moment with um, – you know, one kid home from childcare, sort of, you know, helping with him during the day and then trying to get a lot of work done at night time has meant yeah. that sleep's been in a little bit of short supply. And you're know, having done, you know, finished a PhD last year, sleep was in short, short supply <laughs> towards the end of that. And uh, this was meant to be the year that I was going to get lots of sleep. And and uh, unfortunately, the pandemic's kind of... Yeah, it's just things have way gone those, crazy. Yeah, those plans yeah. have kind of gone out the window, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, trying to do the best I can with that. But it's it's amazing how much difference that makes when you get a good night's sleep in, in so many different oh, facets of your every, life, physical health, area. mental health, the whole lot. Immunity. Yeah. Mm. Yep, totally. Uh, and then the second one uh, is probably a bit of a left field one, but I've just been watching Filthy Rich and Homeless actually on SBS oh, over the last, yeah, yeah, amazing series. Uh, I didn't even realise it was the third series they've done of it. It's actually there was two previous series going back, I think, okay. as early as 2017 or 2018. Uh, but it basically takes a whole bunch of sort of high profile and, you know, pretty well off Australians. And uh, I think there's a UK version and a US version too, if anyone's listening from there. Um, and then basically puts them in scenarios where they're living on the streets, uh, getting to meet and learn the stories of people that are experiencing homelessness in its various forms because there's lots of wow. different forms. Yeah. Um, but I think the thing there that, that really sort of hits home is a couple of things. Is One, how lucky we are to have a home um, 
uh, but just as importantly, the social connections that we have, mm. um, because in so many cases, that's what you know why people have ended up on the street is that they've, you know, for whatever reason in their life, they've had some sort of trauma or uh, difficulty of, of some sort, and they're basically they've had no social connections. If they did, they probably wouldn't be on the street. And so, so sad. Yeah. it is. It is, and it's also you know one of the things that makes it very hard to get out of that situation. You know, once you're there. Yeah, and it's obviously you don't have you know, a network. Exactly. And yeah. and that's that's the thing that comes up over and over again in this show is that people end up on the street because they don't have that network to support them. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, so the second one, that's a very long-winded answer, but I think is to have that sort of you know, maintain your social connections and those relationships with people are, are really important. And obviously in times, you know, like now when we're isolated, it's very easy to let those things kind of drift apart. Um but you never know when you might need them. Yeah, no, that's really nice advice. And I guess on the flip side of that, the other thing we could say is um, it might be a good time for people like us who are lucky and have a nice warm bed to sleep in to support some of those institutions because they probably need it now more than ever. Absolutely. And yeah. I was talking to my wife about this after we watched an episode the other night that, um, you know, the risk is uh, well, it's, it's kind of a, a, a double-edged sword at the moment because a lot of people certainly in Australia actually their their income uh, their unemployment benefits have effectively doubled during this time um, so they're actually doing pretty well um, from that you know being able to make meet their day-to-day -day material needs which is great um, the flip side to that is there's a lot of people losing jobs that are at risk of sliding into that yes um, that situation if they don't have those resources and the supports around them so uh, yeah, that you know, that situation could could very quickly turn the other way in a pretty short space of time. Yeah, and in a country like Australia, it's sort of it's sort of a bit terrifying to think that that exists, but it does, doesn't it? There are people that slip through the cracks for whatever reasons. About a hundred thousand, I think, was the stat. Alan, thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast tonight. It was a real pleasure to chat with you. No worries. Had fun. If you'd like to follow Alan on social media. He's on Twitter and Facebook at Next LVL for Level and NUT for Nutrition. So Next LVL NUT. From a research point of view, you can see what he's up to by following Monash Nutrition and Exercise Clinic or looking at ResearchGate. And I'll put a link to all of that in the show notes. So thank you very much for listening today. And I hope you found my interview with Alan interesting or inspiring. And if you did, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it. If you would like to subscribe to my podcast, Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, there are several ways you can do that. And I'll put links in the show notes. The most popular ways are via Apple Podcasts, Spotify or YouTube. Also, you can follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram. If you would like to contact me, you can send me a message via the contacts page on my website at uh, www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. So please do feel free to suggest topics that you'd like to learn more about and people you'd like to hear interviewed, and I will do my best to deliver that to you. Producing the podcast is a labour of love. We put in a lot of time, money and effort behind the scenes. So if you enjoy Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast and would like to make a contribution, you can do so via Patreon or PayPal, or you can purchase a book from the books page on my website. Check out the contribute page on my website if you're interested. Finally, please take a minute to leave a rating on iTunes. It'll help people find the podcast and it will also help me source excellent guests. Thank you very much for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.